Welcome to the renal ABIM presentation. Acute interstitial nephritis often arises due to antibiotics, NSAIDs, or PPIs. Key clinical features include acute kidney injury, fever, and rash. Urinalysis presents with WBCs, WBC casts, and sometimes eosinophils. Treatment involves removing the offending agent and possibly using systemic corticosteroids or dialysis. Differential can sometimes be rash in lower extremity and WBC in urine because of atherosclerotic causing levda reticularis without offending agent. To minimize the risk of contrast-induced acute kidney injury, it's crucial to hold NSAIDs before procedures, ensure adequate hydration with IV fluids, and use the lowest possible amount of contrast. Chronic kidney disease can lead to mineral bone disorders like osteitis fibrosis cystica and adynamic bone disease. Osteitis fibrosis cystica presents with high PTH of 450, which needs to be brought down for treatment with phosphate diet restriction or phosphate binders, using active VIT-D analogs or calcimimetics, like Sinicalcet. Whereas in adynamic bone disease, PTH is 100, so treatment involves increasing PTH by discontinuing vitamin D analogs and using non-calcium things, including non-calcium phosphate binders. In advanced CKD, Patients can have secondary hyperparathyroidism, which presents with high PTH and high phosphate. It is managed by dietary phosphate restriction. If despite restriction, phosphate is greater than 5.5, then we use non-calcium phosphate binders like sevolimer and lantharum. Despite above measures, if PTH is elevated, treatment would depend on calcium and phosphorus labs. In cases where both are low, phosphorus less than 5.5 and calcium less than 9.5, we can use vitamin D analog. If either calcium or phosphorus is above given values, then we ask calcimimetics like sinicalcet. For membranous nephropathy, a kidney biopsy is unnecessary if PLA2R antibodies are positive, simplifying the diagnostic process. Focal segmental glomerulosclerosis can be primary in which we can see immune deposits on electron microscopy or secondary to increased GFR, like in obesity, toxins, and infections. Management focusing on immunosuppression for primary types and addressing underlying causes for secondary types like weight loss or using ACE inhibitors. Anemia in end-stage renal disease, which initially improved with erythropoietin, but recurred is often due to iron deficiency, which can be diagnosed with low transferrin saturation and low ferritin. In diabetes, patients with ESRD. Kidney transplantation offers a better prognosis than dialysis. Retroperitoneal fibrosis presents with nonspecific pain and can lead to kidney injury. Imaging might show ureteral obstruction without ureteral dilatation and possible IVC obstruction with edema and DVT. Treatment involves steroids and addressing the underlying cause to relieve obstruction. Renal artery stenosis is initially managed with ARBs and diuretics. If resistant, angioplasty or surgery may be necessary to restore proper blood flow. Renal cysts vary from simple to complex, with management ranging from reassurance in simple cysts without need for follow-up to follow-up with imaging in six months in complex mass to cystic mass needing surgical intervention based on the risk of malignancy. Hepatorenal syndrome involves a decline in renal function with oliguria and lofina and is managed with medications like mitodrine, albumin, and octreotide, with liver transplantation being the definitive treatment. Polyuria and dilute urine can result from various causes, including primary polydipsia and diabetes insipidus, which could be central with ADH deficiency, or nephrogenic with ADH resistance. We do water deprivation test initially, which identifies primary polydipsia as urine osmolality increases. Then we check response to desmopressin, which is present in central diabetes insipidus. Nephrogenic DI can be caused by lithium, and is treated with salt restriction and diuretics, including amylaride and thiazides. Hypercalcemia, especially when associated with AKI and metabolic alkalosis, may indicate milk alkali syndrome, which can be caused with OTC meds for heart reflux rather than primary hyperparathyroidism. The first step in evaluation of hypercalcemia is checking PTH levels. If elevated or normal, it's PTH dependent. Then we check urinary calcium excretion. If urinary calcium excretion 250, this means too much calcium because of very high PTH in primary or tertiary hyperparathyroidism, which is getting excreted from kidneys. However, if urinary calcium excretion is below 124 hours, 
This could be familial hypercalcemic hypocalciuria, in which kidneys have resistance to PTH and keep on saving calcium. Hyponatremia can arise from various conditions. To evaluate it, we see serum osmoles followed by urine osmoles followed by urine sodium. Hypertonic or isotonic is due to falsely increased osmolarity in hyperglycemia, hypertriglyceridemia, paraproteinemia, or mannitol intake. Hypotonic hyponatremia with serum osmolality of less than 275 is the true hyponatremia. We check volume then. If hypervolemia, this is because of one of the osis. Cardiosis, cirrhosis, nephrosis. If uvolemic, we move to check urine osmoles and urine sodium. If low urine osmoles of less than 100, it's because of primary polydipsia or malnutrition. If urine osmoles, 100 and sodium is also 40, then it's SIADH. The last is hypovolemic state, which is easy water loss either GI with urine sodium less than 40, or could be renal with urine sodium of greater than 40, with diuretics or RAS insufficiency. Post-exercise hyponatremia can present with nausea, vomiting headache, and seizures, but normal temperature helps differentiate it from heat stroke. Hypernatremia requires assessing volume status and providing appropriate fluid. In euvolemic or asymptomatic, obviously we do free water supplementation. But in cases of symptomatic hypovolemia, we need to give 0.9% normal saline until euvolemic followed by free water with 5% dextrose. Hypomagnesemia often accompanies hypocalcemia and hypokalemia. Persistent hypokalemia despite replacement should prompt a check of serum magnesium levels. Uremic bleeding can be managed with desmopressin, and if ineffective, hemodialysis may be required to control bleeding. Ureteral stones larger than 10 mm or causing severe symptoms require urology consultation, especially if there's obstruction or pain persisting beyond four weeks. Post-obstructive diuresis requires careful management. Replace fluids with isotonic or half-normal saline at a rate less than 50% of the urine volume, such as 200 cc urachur for a patient with a urine output of 600 cc urachur. If severe hypernatremia or hyponatremia develops, treat accordingly with the type of fluid needed to correct electrolyte imbalance. Rhabdomyolysis can significantly alter urine composition. It presents with blood in the urine without red blood cells and can falsely lower the fractional excretion of sodium to less than 1%. Understanding these changes is crucial for accurate diagnosis and treatment. For a patient on Lasix, Losartan, and SGLT2 experiencing dizziness and decreased kidney function, we should stop Lasix first. Similarly, for a patient on lisinopril with KAD and CHF planning for PCI, stopping Lasix for diuresis is correct, but discontinuing lisinopril isn't ideal. Renoprotective medications play a vital role in decreasing proteinuria. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are particularly effective, along with non-DHP calcium channel blockers and SGLT2 inhibitors. Salicylate toxicity presents with early symptoms like tinnitus, vertigo, nausea, vomiting, and tachypnea, progressing to primary respiratory alkalosis and later anion gap metabolic acidosis. Early treatment with activated charcoal within one to two hours and IV sodium bicarbonate can mitigate these effects and support recovery. TMPSMX, a common antibiotic, can lead to severe side effects such as rash, nausea, and most importantly, asked about hyperkalemia and a false rise in creatinine levels. Skin reactions like SIS, 10, dress, and photosensitivity, along with renal and liver complications, require careful monitoring. Avoiding this medication in pregnancy, sulfa allergy, and with ACE inhibitors or ARBs is crucial to prevent adverse outcomes. Understanding acid-base balance is essential for diagnosing metabolic disorders. A normal pH of 7.4, CO2 of 40, and HCO3 of 24 indicate a balanced state. In cases of non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, urine anion gap analysis helps determine the cause whether renal or gastrointestinal, in renal etiology, positive urine anion gap. Differential diagnosis of metabolic alkalosis involves looking at urine chloride levels. Low urine chloride indicates saline responsiveness, often due to vomiting or diuretic overuse. 
while high urine chloride suggests hypervolemic conditions like excess mineralocorticoid activity, which isn't saline responsive. Alcohol toxicity from substances like ethanol, methanol, ethylene glycol, and isopropyl alcohol increases the osmolol gap. Methanol, often found in homemade leak causing confusion. Osmolar gap calculated by lab measured osmol's minus formula used, twice sodium plus glucose divided by 18 plus half BN. Methanol causes vision issues and usually poisoning by homemade alcohol. Ethylene alcohol in antifreeze can cause calcium oxalate crystals. In isopropyl alcohol, osmolar gap is present, but anion gap is absent. Toluene inhalation, commonly from glue sniffing, leads to distal renal tubular acidosis, resulting in hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia. This can cause life-threatening muscle weakness, highlighting the importance of recognizing and addressing the effects of solvent abuse on renal health. Dietary habits play a significant role in reducing kidney stones. For calcium stones, increasing fluid intake, reducing sodium in animal meat, and consuming more potassium-rich vegetables are beneficial. Specific interventions for calcium oxalate stones include adequate calcium and citrate intake and decreased spinach to decrease dietary oxalate. Pharma management of calcium stones include thiazide diuretics. Thiazide doesn't lose things in urine, so no urine stones, and another way is increase urinary citrate by potassium citrate supplementation, as citrate can bind calcium instead of oxalate leading to less stones. For uric acid stones, alkalinization of urine with potassium citrate or using allopurinol are effective, while struvite stones may require surgical approaches along with antibiotics to treat acutely. Hematuria, or blood in the urine, necessitates thorough investigation. In young African patients, hemoglobinopathy should be considered if no structural issues are present. For elderly individuals, CT urography followed by cystoscopy is recommended. Gross blood indicates a non-glomerular source, requiring cystoscopy regardless of baseline glomerulonephropathy. Benign prostatic hyperplasia, BPH, is initially treated with behavioral modifications. If symptoms persist, alpha blockers, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and invasive procedures may be considered. This approach ensures effective management of BPH while minimizing invasive interventions. Thank you.